Aloha. Welcome to the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies Transnational Crime Series Take 20. My name is Lieutenant Commander Keith Wilkins, U.S. Coast Guard Military Fellow at APCSS. Thank you for joining us. I also want to thank Dr. Beth Kuntz, PKI APCSS, in making this webinar possible. Today's topic is Orbit to Ocean, Technology Advancing Time Domain Awareness. We'll have presentations followed by a Q&A session. DKI APCSS has a non-attribution policy. Speakers should not be quoted by name or country without their express permission. This webinar is being recorded. We are honored to have two exceptional speakers. I will introduce each before their presentation. Our first speaker is Mr. Greg Poland. He is a senior fellow for Southeast Asia and director of the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS. He oversees research on U.S. foreign policy in the Asia Pacific with a particular focus on the maritime domain and countries of Southeast Asia. Mr. Poling's writings have been featured in Foreign Affairs, The Wall Street Journal, The Gay Asian Review, and Foreign Policy, among others. He is the author or co-author of multiple works that we'll post links to in the chat. Mr. Poling received an MA in International Affairs from American University and a BA in History and Philosophy from St. Mary's College of Maryland. Greg, the virtual floor is yours. So what I'd like to do is uh, sh start sharing my screen. I'm gonna run through a focus on what's available in the remote sensing space, really in the commercial domain. I, I know that um, most, maybe everybody on the call is familiar with some aspect of, of remote sensing, um, whether they're getting it through, you know, Sea Vision from the US or, or any number of other platforms. But what's often not uh, clear to most practitioners that I talk to is just how much the remote sensing uh, ecosystem has become democratized and commercialized, how a lot of this stuff that just 10 years ago was basically the exclusive domain of um, you know, large economies and, and um, the intelligence community is now really available to academics and independent researchers, small scale operators and, and uh, fisher folk. And we're seeing it used in, in really creative and interesting ways. And for developing states in particular, small island developing states, maybe most of all, the future really is remote sensing. The idea that the challenges of IUU fishing maritime crime, any number of other issues in vast uh, exclusive economic zones can be effectively met with legacy platforms, right? Chasing the bad guys around with patrol boats um, after spotting them on radar, that's impossible. That's a thing of the past. It's a, it's a game of whack-a-mole in which the law enforcement is always at a disadvantage. Um, the future really lies with the ability to ID um, and track dark vessels and illicit actors from, in large part, commercial platforms that are in low Earth orbit that are increasingly cheap, and then prioritizing threats so that only those most important actually warrant uh, high seas interdiction. The rest can be tracked and eventually caught in port. That's, that's the future and the most economical way to do this. So the most um, basic component of this. And what I'm really going to try to do is, is peel back the layers of the onion here, the different components of what I think uh, uh, an effective suite of remote sensing tools looks like. So the most basic that I'm sure most are familiar with is, is AIS, Automatic Identification System Data. And AIS has been around for decades, developed mostly as a traffic separation scheme, um, avoidance of collisions under the IMO. Uh, in its original uh, form, AIS was really only meant for ship to ship and ship to shore communication. Over the last 13 years, there's been a radical evolution though in, in the availability and, and the applicability of AIS. So it was only in 2008 that the first commercial satellite with an AIS transceiver was put into orbit. And now just 13 years later, you have a bevy of companies around the world, um, European, American, Japanese, Chinese companies who have large constellations of low Earth orbit satellites detecting AIS, um, making them publicly available for a fee. Uh, in large part, customers all around the world are seeing the exact same thing that uh, naval and law enforcement personnel around the world are seeing through systems like Sea Vision, 
Um, the only difference still comes in in, in in that operators tend to have access to the ship to ship AIS. And, and those of us on the outside are reliant on the ship to satellite. But uh, to give you an example of, of how this gets applied in, in the day to day, let me run through a few recent reports that my team at CSIS has put out, some of which uh, some on the call might already be familiar with. So one thing this has proven very useful for is tracking activities of Chinese law enforcement in disputed waters of the South China Sea. Beijing, of course, claims um, some form of historic rights, ill-defined sovereign rights over the entirety of the South China Sea. And uh, in so doing, Beijing wants to be seen. China wants everybody in Southeast Asia to know that its Coast Guard is patrolling these areas. So last year, uh, this was what that looked like. You had Chinese Coast Guard vessels broadcasting AIS that was picked up by commercial satellites almost every day of the year from Luconia Shoals off Malaysia, where there has been a Chinese Coast Guard ship broadcasting AIS since late 2013. Second Thomas Shoal off the Philippines, where the BRP Sierra Madre is grounded, which has been the case since at least 2014. Scarborough Shoal uh, off Luzon, which of course has been the case since 2012. And more recently, Vanguard Bank, where uh, Vietnam has a number of important oil and gas projects, most significantly probably the Nam Can San project run by Russia, which was the site of a large standoff in, in late 2019. And then by last June had been added to China's regular patrol route. And so we were able to tell all of this day by day uh, using nothing but commercial AIS. We were also able to, and, and this is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, really drill into specific uh, activities by the China Coast Guard. This was a day-to-day uh, -day operation by the Hijing 5203, one of China Coast Guard uh, vessels that was on the Luconia Shoal Patrol. And you can see it operating around uh, oil and gas operations off Malaysia, particularly by late December, operating around the West Capella, which was a drilling ship that Petronas had contracted to operate in blocks ND1 and ND2. And that made news worldwide as that provoked a standoff between Malaysia and China that went on for six months. This is again, drilling in even farther, one day of AIS traffic around the West Capella. And what you see is Chinese Coast Guard and Chinese fishing vessels, presumably members of China's maritime militia in a high stakes game of chicken with the supply vessels uh, coming to and from Sarawak to supply the West Capella. Uh, and, and over and over and over, you saw this activity where Chinese vessels uh, at high speed would circle around across the bowels of civilian supply vessels, maneuver in ways that were unsafe and violated coal regs and force them to veer off. And then that standoff uh, concluded when China deployed a survey vessel of its own the Haiyang DJ-8, which came down from Hainan and spent about a month, three weeks, operating off the coast of Malaysia and Brunei, being pursued by the Malaysian Coast Guard, MMEA, and the Navy with no real ability to stop them. And it was surrounded the entire time by maritime militia vessels. So I, I don't show these to get into the details of each of these incidents. I'm always happy to talk about that in Q&A, but to show just how versatile the uh, commercially available AIS is all by itself with no other um, remote sensing data. Now, of course, AIS is only good for capturing the activity of vessels that want to be seen. So generally white shipping, right? Commercial vessels who are following the rules or in the case of, of China, law enforcement who wants you to know where they are because they want to be seen as patrolling these areas. How do you find the dark vessels? Well, that's where this um, revolution in cheaper launch vehicles and the profusion of, of access to low Earth orbit is really driving down the price. Um, a lot of technologies that were completely outside of the scope of commercial and academic actors are quickly getting cheaper and cheaper. And the leading edge of that is probably with electro-optical EO satellite imagery which AMTI uh, has become well known for because of all the work we did tracking and publicizing China's island building in the Spratlys. But it's also useful for vessel tracking. So coming back to that standoff between China and Malaysia, I could only show you the West Capella itself, the Chinese uh, Coast Guard vessels, and a couple of the Malaysian supply vessels because those were the ones broadcasting uh, their AIS. What you didn't see there 
were these fishing vessels who were also there that day. And those are actually Vietnamese fishing vessels. We also got plenty of shots of Chinese fishing vessels. When the Haiyang DJ-8 came down and started doing its survey off Malaysia, all the AIS showed you was the Haiyang DJ-8 itself. It didn't show you the almost one dozen Chinese militia vessels, the fishing vessels that were running dark, operating all around it. In the case of the recent standoff at Whitson Reef um, in the Malaysian, or in the, I'm sorry, in the Philippine EZ, which is also claimed by, by Vietnam because Vietnam has four outposts on, on Union Banks nearby, none of these vessels, none of the Chinese militia boats that were there for several months were broadcasting the AIS regularly. Um, maybe a dozen broadcast AIS at some time or another in a way that could be picked up by satellite. And so the only thing that told us how many there were and how long they were was access to commercial satellite imagery like this, where we could count the boats. In fact, we were able to go back over the last year, um, almost daily with Planet Labs imagery, and count exactly how many Chinese Coast Guard or Chinese fishing vessels were at Whitson Reef as well as how many were operating other parts of Union Banks. We've done this to track the Chinese maritime militia across the Spratleys for a couple of years now, and are currently in the middle of a big project uh, being funded by the US government to do this in a really comprehensive way, which we hope to publish uh, later this year, and will launch in uh, sequential events in Manila, Kuala Lumpur, and, and Hanoi. So stay tuned for that. Now, the problem with, with optical imagery, while it's useful, is it can't see everything at once. Um, the really high resolution stuff in the 30 centimeter, 50 centimeter that lets you identify a vessel, not just tell a boat's there, but tell what kind of boat it is and whether or not it's fishing, that um, the passes are relatively infrequent because those are expensive satellites and there's not a ton of them. Planet Labs isn't good enough to tell you a whole lot of detail about a vessel. And the area that you can image in each pass is relatively small. So what's particularly useful um, and increasingly cheap is combinations of other spectra. One of those would be synthetic aperture radar, space-based radar. And another um, that's useful would be the low light imaging done by VIRS, the uh, Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometry Suite that was launched by uh, NOAA and NASA a few years ago. Now, what these are useful for, they don't tell you anything really about the details of the vessel, but they can take images over a very large area, tell you how many boats are there, can correlate that with AIS and tell you how many of them are dark boats. And that can help operators and researchers better cue their more limited optical imagery passes. So uh, for instance, when we were trying to nail down how many Chinese maritime militia boats were operating in the Spratlys a few years ago, we didn't start with the AIS because there basically is no AIS in the Spratleys. Nobody's broadcasting except for the China Coast Guard. And we didn't start with the optical imagery because the areas you can image in a single pass are too small and that gets too expensive. Instead, we started with a combination of VIRs, which are all the yellow dots here. Every one of those yellow dots is a light source picked up by the VIR sensor. And then overlaid that with passes of SAR. So those are the blue dots and the blue boxes are the areas imaged by SAR. It's much larger than you can get in a single pass with optical imagery. Uh, so this first one is of the reefs occupied by Malaysia. Every yellow dot again is, an is a light source. Every blue dot is a metal vessel. So a metal hull that can be picked up by radar. Here are the reefs off the Philippines. Um, not a lot of activity, but I'll note that you can't pick up wooden boats. So it's not gonna pick up most Philippine bancos. Here are the heart of, of the Spratleys, mostly Chinese and Vietnamese occupied features. Now, uh, so if you have AIS, SAR, VIRS, those help you tell how many boats are out there, how many of them aren't following the rules and aren't broadcasting. Uh, and then you try to get over with optical imagery and get a picture, you're still relatively limited. Um, at the end of the day, there's just not enough optical imagery and it can't really ID uh, every vessel. And so the next step, and I think what's really gonna be the a key piece of this suite in the future is gonna be the combination of radio frequency detection. Um, I don't have any images to show of this, mostly because CSIS is still working on pulling together funding packages to try to incorporate this more fully into, into our work. But in the same way that the price of optical imagery and SAR is coming down rapidly, um, I think next we'll see the price of RF detection coming down rapidly. And what this is gonna be useful for if you take the case of a Philippine banca, for instance, a wooden boat, 
can't be picked up by SAR because it's not metal. Um, doesn't broadcast AIS, doesn't isn't required to. Uh, and you're probably not going to spot it in optical imagery. The one thing it is going to be using is some form of VHF radio, um, probably X-band radar. All of these can be picked up by UHF. All of it can be picked up by satellites equipped with RF uh, detection sensors. And you have a real race between a number of companies in the US, Europe, and Japan trying to, and Israel, trying to, to uh, you know, do this best and fastest and cheapest in a way that I think is gonna really help change um, the game here. The, the one other sensor I'll touch on quickly that, that I don't really need to explain is VMS, right? So I don't have pictures of this, but I mean, really none of it, none of it helps, none of it's useful if you can't distinguish good actors from bad, illicit actors from legal actors. And while AIS is useful for commercial traffic, the only reliable way to identify legal fishing boats who have a right to be in your EEZ is gonna be with a nationwide VMS system. And in Southeast Asia, that's a huge problem. The Philippines has no VMS system. Vietnam's rollout is moving quite slowly. Malaysia's VMS is extremely spotty. Um, really only Indonesia and Thailand have a VMS system that helps them see most of their own fishers. And if you don't know where your own fishermen are, it's really hard to tell who the other guy's fishermen are who don't belong there. Um, and of course, the last thing you need to be able to do is crunch all of that data and make use of it. So I will stop there and toss it to Ted, who I think will talk about how to crunch all the data. Our next speaker is Mr. Ted Schmidt. He is the Director of Conservation at Vulcan and Product Manager for Skylight. Ted has spent over 10 years leading efforts to bring fit-for-purpose technology solutions to a range of terrestrial and marine conservation issues. He has worked extensively in Africa with field organizations applying technology to securing and managing protected areas. Prior to joining Vulcan, Ted was a senior program officer for the Computer Science and Telecommunications Board at the United States National Academies of Science. He started his career as a software engineer for IBM, earning patents and several technical achievement awards. Ted holds a Master of Arts in International Science and Technology Policy from George Washington University, a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, and a Bachelor of Arts in German from Purdue University. Ted? The virtual floor is yours. Thanks, Keith. <clears throat> Much appreciated. And uh, Greg, uh, you're you're a great setup person, uh, and uh, and I'm, I am going to talk about um, crunching all this data that Greg talked about. Uh, I I do want to mention uh, Skyline, which is the the uh, the program that um, that I'm the director for, uh, is currently uh, part of Vulcan, which are the um, uh, is the the main uh, enterprise for uh, Paul Allen, uh, who's uh, passed away a couple of years ago, co-founded Microsoft with Bill Gates. We are, we have just very recently announced that we're moving to another Allen organization, the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, and that's very germane to, to the talk I wanna to give today, uh, because I think uh, in addition to the data sources that, uh, that Greg was talking about, and in fact, uh, uh, the data sources feed uh, the analysis that is going to be increasingly um, uh, looked at um, by uh, artificial intelligence, uh, various aspects of that, computer vision, machine learning. Uh, and, and, and as with uh, the satellite assets and the prices coming down, uh, the advances happening right now in artificial intelligence are just leaps and bounds. Uh, and I think we're going to start to see uh, the, the data uh, that, that Greg was talking about, uh, coupled with the AI to just uh, create a whole new set of capabilities uh, uh, for addressing uh, MDA and, uh, and illegal fishing. Um, I've, I've got a number of things I'm gonna touch on here as we go through, uh, and I'll be referencing uh, actually all of these data sources that Greg mentioned. Uh, I'm gonna start with, uh, with AIS and with the basic stuff. Uh, Probably most of you have seen the geofencing. I know C-Vision uh, supports geofencing. Uh, very basic tool, uh, rules-based, no fancy uh, artificial intelligence involved there. Uh, but being able to create a custom area of interest uh, and be able to be uh, notified when, um, when a vessel has entered that area. Uh, most of the platforms out there uh, do that. Um, and, uh, and it's very useful, uh, but, it, but it only gets you so far. 
Um, and then um, I'm going to, uh, another thing with, uh, with AIS. So as Greg pointed out, you can get a long way with AIS. We're actually trying to push the boundaries a bit. And some of the, uh, some of the things that are seen as a, uh, a negative on AIS, we're trying to flip those around and actually use those. If you turn off your AIS, it means you're probably doing something you're not supposed to be doing. So we're trying to, to, to actually identify those cases. Where did AIS go off? Was it near something that was interesting or not? Um, and then surface those up uh, and say, hey, th this may be a vessel of interest. It may have gone into an area it was not supposed to while the gap was, was off or, or while the AIS was off. So this is, this is actually an actual example we had uh, in, a, in a marine protected area uh, off the coast of Mexico. Um, just setting uh, some, some things, I, I don't know uh, how much uh, you know about machine learning. I am very far from an expert myself. Uh, I, I know what it does. Uh, the how part uh, is, is quite a mystery to me, frankly, uh, but we have lots of uh, great folks uh, working on these problems. One of the things that's important and especially uh, uh, important um, to, uh, where we can use help is forming the questions that we're trying to, to answer. So the, the better form the questions are, the more deeply we can look into the data to identify them. The vaguer the questions are, the less useful the, the machine learning is. Um, there are a couple of examples here of what I mean by that. And I think what's really important, Greg uh, pointed out some of the incredible work that CSIS is doing uh, in the video before we started the session, there was uh, some discussion about Global Fishing Watch. Those are um, expert analysts that, that, are, that kind of know where to look. They know what they're looking for. They've learned as, as humans are quite good at to intuit some things. What machine learning really does is help surface some of those things. Machine learning will not do the intuition that humans can do, but what it can do is look for patterns and surface those things and learn what those patterns are and then surface those to analysts who can then hone in and start digging in um, in specific areas without having to go through the millions and millions of data points. And so I think it's really important to understand that's the real value of machine learning. It doesn't eliminate the analyst. It, it basically helps turn the analyst into a, a, a superpower and be able to really um, hone in and, and get uh, focused on the things that are of most interest. Um, so, some of the, just very briefly, not getting into any details here, uh, but really um, what, what machine learning is trying to do is to, to, to automate some of the judgment, the, 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 the mundane tasks that an analyst has to do, uh, the things that they have to look for. And in fact, the way machine learning works is it has to get, um, we have to get a labeled annotated data from expert analysts who tell us, ah, this looks like an interesting uh, pattern for these reasons. And then, then the algorithms can be built to program those things. Um, and, you know, here, here just uh, going just uh, one step deeper, sort of what are the kinds of things that, that can be looked for? So uh, slowdowns and changes, uh, long stretches and headings, uh, and, and then, um, you know, uh, uh, frequency and so on. So those are the kinds of things that the algorithms are looking for, the patterns they're looking to draw out. Um, and then you start to get to do interesting things with that. So for instance, being able to determine different types of fishing. Um, once you, you know what you're looking for, and of course an analyst can look at some of these tracks and say, oh, that's a purse saner, that's a trawler, uh, a squid jigger and, and so on. Um, you can teach uh, the uh, analysis algorithms to, to identify these things and surface them. And an analyst could say, you know, I want to know uh, a trolling in this area um, and, and then get those things surfaced to them without having to hunt for them. And the machine can just automatically be looking for these things all the time and, and surfacing uh, this sort of information. Um, here is an example of surfacing loitering uh, or, or uh, suspected rendezvous events. So this is, this is a true machine learning um, application here. Uh, what you see over on the left is where um, the system, in, in this case Skylight, uh, we, have, um, we have surfaced uh, the, the circles 
Uh, the red circles being ones that are of high confidence um, and, and these algorithms uh, do have sort of confidence levels uh, but and the yellow ones being a, a lesser confidence and if you can see the gray ones in your image there those are the lower confidence ones I, we in, in this um, slide here I've picked one of the high confidence ones uh, this is a what we call a one-sided rendezvous what it is is we've got one vessel transmitting AIS it, it uh, it's tra maybe transmitting AIS because it's not anywhere that it's not allowed to be, uh, but it's behaving in a way that indicates that it's loitering or potentially rendezvousing with other vessels. Uh, and the, the algorithm has been trained to detect that sort of behavior. Um, and, and here you can see this vessel is hanging just outside the, the Guam EEZ. Um, maybe it's a, a mothership uh, waiting and, and uh, Greg uh, gave a nice picture of one of those where you've got a mothership and then all the, the small vessels coming into it. Um, and we're able, because it has its AIS on, to see what it is. And in fact, it's a fish carrier. Uh, and then we've got tracks here and we hone in on uh, about four days worth of tracks rather than giving all the tracks. Uh, you can see it's got some AIS gaps in transmission. Uh, you can see where it has slowed down, uh, what uh, speed ranges it's going where it appears to have been uh, loitering uh, and, and potentially rendezvousing with other vessels, and then where it headed off uh, uh, after that. So really nice tool uh, using machine learning. And you can see there are a lot of these uh, to go in and, and start looking for potential rendezvous events uh, where you may have just one vessel uh, transmitting. Um, and then um, vessel detection, um, Greg hit on this. Um, what, what is interesting, of course, is that the, the satellite providers, as well as uh, lots of uh, short computer vision folks, uh, the, 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 um, the images taken by the satellites, uh, huge images, uh, if you had to have someone go through by hand and identify all of the vessels in there, uh, you'd be talking a, a, a whole lot of processing time for humans to sit and do that. Uh, you can teach the machines to do that using computer vision, which is one of the artificial intelligence disciplines, to go and identify, uh, and depending on, on the resolution or the type of image it is, uh, you can detect uh, what type of vessel it is, you, you can detect the headings, uh, the, the size and type of vessel, and so on. Um, and so, um, and obviously, depending on the resolution, um, you'll have different, um, you know, levels of ability to, to detect things. The synthetic aperture radar, one thing I wanted to mention um, is, you know, um, we, we did an experiment with electro-optical off of Gabon with Maxar uh, to try and uh, detect uh, illegal fishing there. Uh, of course, you're, you're in a, a, a tropical zone. Uh, six months, I, I don't think we got a single image without clouds. So there's where something like synthetic aperture radar can, can really come in and, and get through the clouds, even though you don't get the, the imagery there. Um, with, with SAR, um, Greg mentioned the correlation. Again, that's something you can automate uh, with, uh, with, the, with the, um, the algorithms to do that correlating. Uh, in this image, you see the, the red squares are all uh, vessels that are trans, that are, um, that are, uh, det were detected in SAR, but were not uh, uh, transmitting AIS. The gray ones uh, were correlated to be both AIS and SAR, so they were not dark. The red ones were dark. And if you click on any of those dark vessels, you can see the, uh, the SAR imagery. Um, and here again, using a bit of computer vision to detect a potential heading, based on analyzing that image, even as fuzzy as it looks to us, there is the ability for the, the algorithms to, to determine a heading based on, on that image and be trained to do that. Um, I mentioned the correlation already. Um, <clears throat> here you can see off the coast of Ghana, lots of, of vessels. Um, this uh, on the lower, um, lower right uh, or the lower part of the image, uh, that's a bathymetry layer, so you, you see fishing along there. <clears throat> that was an area where they, they um, asked us to, to get a, a, a SAR image. It suspected a lot of fishing there, and you can see very few vessels uh, that are, um, that are um, transmitting AIS um, and, and picked up on the SAR. 
Um, and then um, Greg mentioned how hard it is to get uh, electro-optical imagery and why uh, use of SAR or VIRS or other things to get this wide uh, range. Um, and this is, this is where there, there really is a huge promise uh, in being able to do what's called tip and cue, uh, where you tip off of AIS or SAR or VIRS or, or RF, um, radio frequency stuff is, is truly emerging. Uh, to be able to get that electro-optical image. This was actually, this image was actually taken, again, uh, a partnership we did with Maxar to, to, um, to test out uh, if we could do a tip on AIS and get an image. And of course you can see a Persaner here, a beautiful image of a Persaner um, <clears throat> that we got. Uh, this was a, a vessel that was actually operating legally uh, just outside of this, uh, this no-take MPA zone. Of course, we weren't seeing any AIS being transmitted inside the no-take zone. And that, and that, of course, points to the need to get um, synthetic aperture radar or VIRS or RF, uh, where you can detect those dark vessels and then um, cue the electro-optical uh, imagery um, satellite to go and, and get the image of those. Um, and we, the challenge is getting that at low latency enough at a cost that's affordable. We're not quite there yet, but as Greg said, we're, we're well on the way. Um, there are at least three pilots I know going on uh, with uh, platforms uh, like Skylight and with uh, RF providers uh, to, to try and do this sort of tip and cue activity. Uh, so I expect we'll see this emerging very soon. Um, I just want to point out some other examples. I know we're focused on illegal fishing. Uh, you know, there, there are related uh, uh, criminal activities that go along, of course, with illegal fishing, like labor violations. Uh, we also want to be able to detect things like buoys and fads that may be in use. These are all things that we believe we can detect with machine learning, and we're actively developing algorithms, doing some predictive uh, things. Uh, so if you've Got a vessel. Um, a point was made about um, you know not the you know focusing um, on getting um, uh, the bad actors when they come into port. You're not going to get out and on the water assets with uh, you know with everyone only with very high uh, you know high uh, priority things. So if we can uh, build the ML machine learning algorithms to um, detect when a vessel is heading back, get the alert because we know that's already a vessel of interest. These are things uh, that, that we think we can help analysts um, surface and, and prioritize things. And then um, we're also looking at things like, uh, like speed regulations in certain areas, uh, you know, with whale strikes, trying to minimize things like that, um, oil spill detections, and then risk profiling. This one, particularly with IUU vessels, being able to, again, narrow down what you're, uh, what you're prioritizing, what you're looking at as an analyst, uh, if there's a vessel uh, that we can take into our algorithms and say, wow, these vessels are on the you know, high suspect list, and now we see them approaching uh, an area of interest, or we see them behaving in a certain way, we can surface those things to the analyst uh, as high risk activities, again, to help prioritize um, uh, the, the work that um, the enforcement folks are doing. Um, and I will end with that. Uh, and, um, and hand it over. Uh, look forward to, to any um, uh, questions uh, as part of the Q&A. And I'll hand it back to you, Keith. And Greg, I'll uh, take the first question over to you that came into the chat. Was, what's the current orbit period for SAR, VIRS, and RF detection satellites that could be applied for surveillance planning purposes? So I probably don't have <clears throat> the, the latest answers on all of this, and I suspect there are some on the call who know better. Um, so when it comes to VIRS, it's, it's nightly. And I mean, the big problem, um, as, as Ted indicated with other things like EO, is the weather. So nightly, you know, in, in like the South China Sea, for instance, means useless for months at a time. Um, there's also a problem if it doesn't really work in, in the South Atlantic because of issues with the Earth's magnetic field that I barely understand. Um, on SAR, uh, the closer you get to the equator, the longer the return rate gets, um, for at least for the ones that I'm familiar with, um, that I've tried to work with, with MDA, which Ted mentioned, and, and um, Airbus. Uh, so 
you know, in, in cases where I've tried to do it, you're talking a couple times a week, I think, is, is kind of the max return you're going to get closer to the equator. But by 2025, I expect that to be radically changed, right? So you, you've got at least four companies I know of, um, two Americans, a Japanese and um, Finnish company, ISI, that are trying to put up larger constellations of low-Earth orbit satellites. That'll, so I think we're basically going to have a, a surfeit of daily returns on SAR in the next few years that are going to be much, much cheaper. Um, RF, I only know of two companies, um, at least two that I've worked with closely enough, Hawkeye 360 in, in the US and um, Unseen Labs in France, that have kind of working constellations I think they both now got their second constellations up. Um, and so I, I think they could theoretically get something like daily returns in most places, but with just two constellations, uh, they've got too many customers to realistically do that. So I, I think it becomes a, a more a problem of as, as more competitors enter the market, RF is going to get closer to daily uh, returns over the next few years. Ted, over to you for Skylight. Are there any mechanisms within the tool for analysts to share information between them? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so um, there, there are mechanisms. Um, and in fact, um, uh, I'll mention a specific one um, that, uh, that we're working with. Um, Skylight is working with C-Vision to be able to uh, share uh, analysis outputs that we, uh, that we surface in Skylight directly via API, uh, application programming interface, so computer to computer, uh, to C-Vision to be able to surface that in the C-Vision uh, user interface. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it's really a, a question of, of how open the platforms are and layered on top of that, of course, how open the organizations are to sharing with each other. Uh, I think some of the regional management organizations have been set up to, to facilitate that data sharing capability. I think many of them are still in the stages of being able to, to do that more effectively. Uh, the Foreign Fisheries Agency in the South Pacific, um, some very high capacity folks, and I think they're, they're doing some great work there. Uh, and I think you're gonna see more and more sharing. In fact, they've reached out to us specifically um, they have the technical capacity to be able to consume the analysis that we produce via the, the API, via the programming interface instead of the user interface, um, and be able to share that in, in screens and surface it uh, and share that with, uh, with our analysts. So um, it just, just as with some of the satellite stuff, I think there are a lot of the pieces in place to be able to support sharing. Um, I think it, it, beyond the technical uh, requirements to do so, uh, the organizational um, uh, the organizational authorizations and, and support to do that, the interagency collaborations are really critically important to making that happen. Thanks, Ted. And Lynn, appreciate your comment in there, just uh, stating where C-Vision has chat, where users can share information. Really appreciate sharing and using the chat function there. Our next question, Ted, and I think this will go back to you in regards to the tipping queue. Yeah. Remote sensors can be used for tipping besides AIS. What other RS can be used for queuing besides EO? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so just make sure. Let's see what other uh, what other RS can be used uh, for queuing. Okay. So, um, so certainly uh, we should be able to tip on SAR. Um, you know, as you saw with SAR, you get a very fuzzy image. You can't tell what the vessel is for the most part. Um, the, the trick there is, um, you know, can you get the SAR image, get it out quick, uh, get out identified quickly enough and off to go and cue that uh, electro-optical image. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's a, a challenge, but it's one we think um, we, we'll, we'll see um, happen, uh, be overcome very soon. So you can tip off of that. Um, RF is the one that everyone is really looking at right now. And, and as I mentioned, I, and uh, Greg, I also only know of Unseen uh, and, and Hawkeye 360. I know that the two of them are involved in at least three pilots, and I'm sure they're trying to do pilots with everyone right now to, to obviously to prove out their technology. Um, but the, they, um, you know, looking to use uh, RF to be able to also cue 
uh, an EO satellite um, and, and get a, uh, an EO image uh, by queuing off of, uh, by tipping off of, a, of an RF. Um, you can also tip off of Veers. Uh, of course, Veers is picking up, uh, you know, lights at night. So, you know, a tipping, uh, a tipping there may not be effective because you, you have to, the EO obviously requires daylight. So by the time you get the asset in place, the vessels are, are likely have moved off. So those are the some of the things you have to think about when you're thinking about what you can tip and queue off of. In theory, you, you could tip off of AIS to get SAR. Um, Maybe that's useful, but you know, if somebody's doing something they don't want, uh, they don't want people to see. They probably get their AI us off anyway. So some of these aren't technical challenges; they're just sort of logically what do you, what sort of behavior do you expect? Thanks, Ted. Greg, over to you. What is the role of partner nations like the U.S. in supporting access to remote sensing data processing? I think this is the most important role that we're going to see. Uh, partner, you know, donor nations like the U.S., Australia, Japan play in the future. Um, our model to date and perfectly reasonably has been provision of legacy platforms, you know, giving uh, patrol vessels, patrol aircraft, UAVs training, you know, and, and most of our training is Navy to Navy, not Coast Guard to Coast Guard. So we end up spending all this money and time on things like you know, high-end naval war fighting and, and occasionally, you know, high seas interdiction. Um, we haven't spent as much time on the training on, on things like how do you run a watch center and, and stuff like that. But, and, and increasingly a big chunk of what we're doing is things like providing the remote sensing directly through sea vision. And all of that's useful, but as the commercial market explodes, the idea that you're going to use Sea Vision as the only tool, or that Sea Vision is going to be able to funnel all of this in, is just not going to work, right? It's going to be looking at this huge ecosystem through a tiny pinpoint camera, and it's not going to make sense anymore. Um, particularly because the U.S. is going to have a lot of, you know, the Navy and DOT are going to have problems with really only being able to feed American companies into Sea Vision, and like, no, you know, the, the Americans aren't always going to be the best and the cheapest options, and so increasingly the role of the outside providers is going to move from providing the sensors to providing the analysis and let the individual partner nations go onto the market for the sensor data themselves. If I could add to that, Keith, um, I, I, I think uh, Greg made some really great points there. Uh, uh, as a uh, you know, as a private entity, uh, and, and AI AI two is a, a not for profit of a five hundred one c three global fishing watch. Another great example. Um, I, I think you're seeing some private actors there. I'm really encouraged by the engagement that uh, you know the U.S. government agencies. Uh, we're working closely with UNODC. They provide a lot of capacity building through their global maritime crime program on IUU. What I'm seeing is tremendous public-private partnership. I think this is really powerful, uh, and it provides that analytic capability. You're going to see, you know, we, we have a lot of really smart AI engineers. We can make those algorithms available uh, and, and make them available through our government partners. The Canadians are also developing a platform. I know they're going to pilot that with, uh, with FFA. Um, so you're seeing... Different government groups, the EU also has a, pro a technology platform going on. So you're seeing, uh, you know, different government groups partnering with private entities to bring this technology, not only the sensors, but the an analytic capability. You know, we're a small team, um, and I, I think it's true of, uh, of the other uh, providers. We're focused on the technology. We need folks like the Coast Guard, the Navy, uh, the, the UNODC, and other partners to be able to bring that capacity and that training to the, to the partner nations, help build that capacity in those partner nations so that they walk, you know, when they walk away, they've got that capacity built up uh, in, in, the, in the partner nations. Thanks again for, uh, and, you know, Ted, thanks for adding on the great comments there. Great points all around. Ted, another question over to you. And then also from the audience, I thank you for both of your presentations and uh, chat. Are the loading and rendezvous detections being run on live feeds? If so, what is the time lag from AIS hit to classification, assuming multiple points are necessary to do so for these types of detections? Ted? Yeah, great, great question. 
So we do have a uh, um, uh, live AIS. So we're getting uh, we're getting the AIS right as it comes in uh, with no delays. And this is a contrast to say Global Fishing Watch. They're looking historically, and I didn't mention this actually in my talk, and I should have. Uh, you know, when you apply machine learning to historical data, the algorithm can look uh, back at the data through time. When you're building that picture in real time, um, the machine learning algorithm has to actually be built differently because, um, because you're sort of piecing the picture together as it's going. Um, typically, we're surfacing uh, those rendezvous, and, and it depends on how clear of an event it is. But typically, we need you know, an hour or two's worth of tracking data to begin to get the confidence level that we can surface it. It may take longer depending on the, the type of movement we're seeing. But we're talking you know, um, hours here, uh, not, certainly not days uh, uh, or, or so on. So we, we really are surfacing, surfacing these in near real time. And Greg, we'll go over to you for first on this one. And Ted, you know, I have a feeling you may have some um, additional input. But for the Asian Maritime Transparency Initiative, how successful has the program been so far detecting illegal activities, and such as specifically illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing? And Ted, this is where I'll offer maybe the machine learning uh, process that you've just uh, discussed in there. What's the probability of success? Any confirmed cases that resulted in prosecution? And finally, how are you working on operationali operationalizing the data for actual enforcement operations? Greg, over to you. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'll be honest, it, it hasn't, detecting IU fishing and kind of reporting on specific incidents hasn't been ANTI's mission. Um, the, when we're looking at dark fishing vessels, we're kind of specifically looking for government-linked dark fishing vessels. So we're trying to ID Chinese militia, Vietnamese militia, um, vessels that are actually Coast Guard and Navy and pretending to be fishing, that kind of thing. We have done, I mean, in the process of doing that, we've gotten a pretty good sense of what fishing activity looks like in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea in order to distinguish that from the illicit actors. But we've done that based on historic data. Um, and so I've, I, I can't honestly answer the question. The one time we have really tried to do this was an effort to pitch some work in the Pacific Islands that would have combined SAR and RF um, to tip and QEO collections and, and try to get a handle on some high seas transshipment. Um, and it still was just kind of too expensive at the time. So we're, we're revisiting uh, the effort now. Yeah, um, thanks, Greg. Um, you know, I think it's actually a really important point here. The work that, that Greg and CSIS do and, and very few other people do uh, is tremendously valuable to, to be able to do that deep research. You know, some of the examples that Greg gave were tremendous, um, you know, understanding, uh, you know, what, what the Chinese were trying to do there. I mean, gaining those insights are really important and you need to do that deep analysis to make that happen. Um, a tool like Skyline, and, and by the way, um, folks like Global Fishing Watch falls somewhere uh, sort of next in the spectrum, um, you know, we saw in the uh, in the in the pre-talk um, video uh, how they use some of the data to detect the the illegal fishing that was going on in North Korea. Um, you know, th those those types of research and analysis things, and then being able to get people out there, those are tremendously important. Where Skylight fits in uh, again, and Greg is absolutely right, doing the on the water real time enforcement tremendously difficult. We're not quite there yet. So we're, not, we're certainly not quite there yet affordably. Uh, those are, I think, very rare things. Uh, so when people ask that, like say, oh, I need real time, you know, really, you really want to push and say, well, why do you need real time? What are you trying to accomplish? There are places where it can be useful. Where we've seen the most impact, where I can give some, some specific examples, is planned operations. So named operations, uh, we, we did that with the, the U.S. Navy with NAVAF uh, in Cabo Verde. In fact, they, they've had some operations going on there. They brought assets in to help the Cabo Verdeans be able to uh, detect. They used Skylight in that case, along with Sea Vision, to um, get the SAR imagery, do the correlations, do some of the, you know, uh, oh, there's a, there's, we see a rendezvous that happened a couple of hours ago. We can get an asset out there and do that interdiction. 
but that's because they had planned operations, planned patrols, and there's where a tool like Skylight can really start to, to be effective. We did a similar thing in Ghana with the Ghanaian Navy. Um, uh, we, we saw they were able to cite 14 vessels that were not transmitting AS, and they pulled in uh, several vessels that had illegal fish on board. But that was part of a planned operation. The assets were in place. Um, they, were, they were partnered with UNODC um, and, and really able to bring those assets in. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's the qualifier I would put. If you're doing planned operations, then you can make some of these things happen where it's like, oh, I've seen something and I, and I haven't got a planned operation. I'm doing routine patrols, extremely difficult. I do think in five years or so, we'll start to see more opportunities for that. Can the data from monitoring seabird movement patterns, which often follow fishing vessel tracks, be integrated and used in these systems? Is this being done? Uh, it's, it's not yet being done by us, although I know about it um, and we've, we've, taught, we've had internal discussions about it. Uh, it's just a matter of prioritizing. Absolutely. I think it's really cool stuff. Um, you know, there are also uh, 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 fish that are tracked. Um, you know, the fishermen go where, the, even the illegal fishermen go where the fish are. If you know where the fish are, uh, then uh, you're going to find uh, people fishing. And so there absolutely is an opportunity to use track seabirds, uh, other, other animals uh, that, that um, are, you know, are indicative of where you're likely to see fishing activity. Um, and, and this is where the machine learning algorithms can really come in. You can't have humans pouring over these volumes of data manually. You really need um, to be able to, to surface the interesting things so that smart people like Greg can, can know where to look and start really doing that deep analysis. Greg, we're going to go over back to you. And Ted, if you have anything to add on after this to provide that kind of government and then non-government organization perspective, it might blend well. But these tools and capabilities were previously only in the domain of high capability intelligence agencies. The new paradigm is developing and these tools are now available to NGOs that support governments. How do governments and maritime law enforcement agencies need to prepare to, do to join this new paradigm and prepare their people to effectively use these new tools. Greg. Part of it, and maybe, maybe a, one of the most difficult parts, I think, is the cultural shift that needs to happen um, in the U.S. as much as in any other nation. Uh, you know, anybody, probably most people on the call who are, who are from DOD know that the first rule is you classify everything. You classify an unclassified email because it went across your desk. Everything has to be classified unless somebody higher up forces you to unclassify it for some reason. And so the number, the sheer number of times over the last, you know, what have we been doing this for now? Seven years at AMTI and I've been running it for six. I mean, probably 90% of what we've published have been things that the DOD knew six months earlier. Um, and then and kind of sat on their hands waiting for us to publish it. I mean, half of it's from stuff that the DOD knew and then kind of like told us, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you should really look at this island and see if there's anything interesting going on. Or not even DOD. I mean, half the time it's coming from the region. Somebody saying, hey, I can't tell you why, but, you know, that that culture is increasingly out of step with, with what I said at the top, the democratization of this remote sensing. Like, we are not that far out from anybody, you know, any independent researcher at the university or, or a think tank or an NGO being able to monitor every vessel, at least every metal hulled vessel over like five meters anywhere on the earth. And, and when we get to that point in the next decade, the idea that the actual sensing data belongs classified in any sense is, is going to be a bit silly. So I, I think that's the, the biggest change that is happening, but it's happening pretty glacially. Um, I, I, I want to add a lot. I think Greg hit all the right points there. Um, what I am encouraged to see, and I mentioned it before, is this, uh, this really effort for public-private partnership. Uh, you know, there's some activities going on uh, to really uh, try and break down some of the silos, and I think that's very encouraging. Uh, and, you know, the, the fact that, um, that Sea Vision is, is open to... Um, uh, connecting to our API and taking an analysis from this, you know, this private entity that's, uh, that's doing analysis on illegal fishing. I think these are really encouraging signs. I, I would also just add, you know, the data that goes into Skylight, there's, there's truly, 
if you got enough money, you can, you can get this data. Uh, it's not classified data. Uh, and, and in fact, we, we specifically want to uh, avoid the classified data because th then all the, the, the barriers and things go up. So um, yeah, I think that's all I'll add. Keith, can I just touch on one other thing? I, I, so I don't want to make it seem like this is just a problem for the Pentagon and DOD. Another big issue here that I think we're going to have to kind of grips with in the next few years is the issue of um, the proprietary nature of most BMS data around the world. That, so that applies in the U.S. It applies internationally for a lot of the RFMOs, including um, you know, WCPFC. As, as we get to a point where all of the kind of involuntary signals you're putting out are being seen constantly by everybody. The idea that the voluntary transponder you have on your boat should be kept secret is going to just be silly. Um, and those who continue to do it are going to be left behind because the law enforcement agencies who don't publicize their BMS are going to be operating with one hand tied behind their back. Boy, I, I, all I'll say is second, second, third that, um, Greg, I, fantastic point. Greg and Ted, re really appreciate that and can't agree more of just how important that coordination and collaboration is, no matter if it's government, non-government organizations, and whatever domain it is that we're talking about. Um, Ted, another specific question about Skylight. How does Skylight identify that a vessel has turned off their AIS? In areas that only have satellite AIS, this seems difficult since there may not be continuous coverage. Do you create your own AIS tracks? Uh, so the machine learning algorithms will, uh, um, will attempt to figure out the, the gaps and, and what the lines were. Um, we, you know, what we're doing is detecting uh, that, that there is an AIS signal, uh, knowing that, that it's been transmitting. Um, now, if it's in an area where, where there is a gap in the AIS, uh, you know, that they're, that's not picking up, um, we, we will factor that in and, and try and, and have an understanding of what the coverage is. We could make mistakes, of course, um, but it, it is important to deeply understand your AIS provider and what they're giving you. Um, and each one of them has strengths and weaknesses um, and, and differences. And in fact, we actually recently switched from one provider to a different provider. Um, the provider we're in at now, um, they, they actually also... Um, provide, um, they, they have uh, ships with, uh, with AIS receivers on them to try and get more coverage. Um, so, um, you know, and ideally, uh, you, you're able to, to actually get the data across all the different AIS providers to minimize any gaps. But yes, um, we're, the way we detect the gaps is, is uh, knowing that it's been transmitting, seeing that it's gone off, and then we see it come back on, and we analyze that gap time and, and determine is this an area where we should have seen uh, transmissions where there should be cover, should have been coverage uh, and filter the ones out where we say, no, this, this was, was an area where we wouldn't have coverage. And Greg, over to you for this one. Interested to hear your thoughts on the best approach to use these technologies to complement current efforts with the FFA and PTCCC to combat illegal fishing and illicit trafficking. And I'll also offer beyond just IUU fishing, you know, any sorts of transnational organized crime, you know, IUU fishing is just a piece of the iceberg, so to speak. What gaps exist and what's the best way for the global community to fund these investments? Greg? It's a really big question. So let me just take, you know, the FFA um, example, which I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with, although I, I do most of my work in, in Southeast and Northeast Asia, not the Pacific Islands. So you, you've got an organization where the vast majority of MDA is the responsibility of small island developing states who have a very limited number of, of air and, and surface vessels and even more limited radar to, to watch these vast EEZs. Plus, you've got a very loose network of agreements through the RFMO to monitor the high seas pockets between them, in many cases falling unfairly on the smallest and least capable members of the FFA. Right? I mean, if you look at what like Micronesia has to monitor, for instance, it's absurd. Um, a huge component of the, I mean, kind of the answer up to now has been the voluntary use of BMS by uh, distant water fishing states, um, which is problematic for a lot of reasons we've already touched on. 
providing um, legacy platforms, which has mostly been the job of the US and Australia, continues to make some sense. I mean, it's, at some point, the really bad guys have to be arrested and they have to be interdicted on, on the high seas. But I think the, the end goal, if we look at 20 years and say that you know, you successfully established a, re, a, a system that allows effective monitoring of fisheries across the FFA area, it's going to rely on commercial remote sensing data, this web of commercial remote sensing that we've talked on, talked about um, at length, probably fed into hopefully one, but in, increasingly it looks like it's going to be a multitude of fusion centers in the region, you know, in, in Suva and, and Australia and, and Honiara. In any case, that'll be a big component of it. And then the other component will be that that will allow um, ultimately PSMA to be the way that you actually enforce your fisheries laws. Everybody will be a member of the Port State Measures Agreement. Nobody will have to waste their precious time and resources chasing down every, you know, Vanuatu flagged fisherman in the high seas pocket. They've got to offload somewhere and you track them from site of illegal activity to harbor. And that's where you make the arrest. And then everybody can focus the, you know, extraordinarily small number of vessels they have on chasing the really bad guys, the smugglers, the, you know, illicit actors, the, you know, what have you, those engaged in, in slavery at, at sea. I think that that, and, and probably some version of that, is what ultimately global fisheries enforcement looks like if it's going to work. Ted, back to you. How deep below the water can Skylight Sea, and is it interoperable with other platforms? If so, or even if not, what about data and information security? Uh, okay, I'm not sure about seeing below water. Um, so Skylight, uh, Skylight is a is a, a data platform. So actually, what 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 does with this? Uh, what I do think of though is we've talked a lot about the satellite assets, the remote sensing, absolutely critical to to the, the uh, dark vessel detection. But there is a potential for getting data, uh, and and we're you know. I know there's been a lot of hype about drones, but there is potential for if you know where to send a drone to collect data, to be able to collect imagery, um, uh, autonomous underwater vehicles collecting data, um, sometimes it, it may be even collecting uh, data on where the fish are and things like that. Uh, but more data is always good. Um, and so uh, the seeing underwater would really be if we could, um, if there was data that could be collected underwater and transmitted back to a platform like Skylight to use. So interoperability. Um, so I mentioned, uh, I've already mentioned the, uh, the data, uh, the sharing capability uh, via uh, application programming interfaces, APIs, to be able to share outputs um, and data. Um, and, and we'd like to be able to share data we, uh, we have uh, with other platforms where they may have their own algorithms that they've built that they can apply uh, and provide analytic outputs to. I think that that um, that interoperability and, and being able to share between platforms is really critical to being able to address the problem. It's something we're actually actively focused on. I mentioned we're, we're engaged with C-Vision on a, a proof of concept. We're also very, Skylight, we're very actively engaged with Global Fishing Watch, with tree map tracking and, and with others to be able to, um, to interoperate and collaborate uh, across our data platforms. Um, so I, th I think that's critically important. Thanks, Ted. Greg, over to you on this one. And Ted, if you have comments, please jump in too. But how, do you, how can you know the identification of dark ships, such as the name of ships without AIS data? How do you correlate that? Um, well, lately it's been really helpful when a Philippine Coast Guard ship drives right up next to one of them, takes a picture, <laughs> and then gives it to the press. That, that helps us a lot. Um, aside from that, you can't. So I, I do think, I mean, eventually there, there may be technical solutions to this. There is some promise that RF detection will be able to move beyond just saying here's a boat to saying here's a you know boat with uh, you know it's it's expand has this specific signature and so we can at least say what the manufacturer is and it probably is a Chinese boat and, and maybe it gets farther than that and at some point you can identify specific boats. There's there's also other technologies. I mean in 10 years we might be talking all this might seem quaint as we talk about I don't know, the unique um, acoustic signatures of engines, which is something that I see John Middleman on the call. I've, I've you know, heard a little over my head. But so 
But in the here and now, um, if they're not broadcasting IF and they're not broadcasting BMS, somebody has to get a picture of a whole number. That's or or you have to be able to persistently track the vessel until it eventually reaches port, right? Those are your two options. So the big gap now, and I think eventually you get there, is if you have persistent tracking, you just wait. They've got to show up and offload at some time. No vessel stays out forever. Or alternatively, if if they're really problematic, you eventually deploy, you know, a, a UAV and snap a picture of, of the bow number. This is not, you know, I, I guess it's not that different than what the multinational coalition is doing to combat North Korean illegal transshipment in the East China Sea and the LC right now. We fly overhead, we get a picture, we collect the data, we send those pictures to the UN and we say, look, here's all the whole numbers. We know where these guys are coming from. I, I uh, Greg, really hit all, all the points there. Um, I guess I would just add, it, it, I, it probably is five or 10 years away, but things like acoustic signatures, RF signatures, those those right now feel very far out of reach, but things are advancing so quickly, uh, particularly with, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing that you apply uh, artificial intelligence to, to try and be able to uh, to discern things down to that level. Uh, you know, we're, we're already figuring out individual animals and, and people, uh, you know, with facial recognition. Um, it's not out of the realm of possible at all that we'll eventually be able to get unique acoustic signatures or unique um, 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 uh, RF signatures, just like we have uh, DNA or fingerprints. Keith, Keith I, I'm sorry, I want to come back on, on one issue here that, that, I, that I've come across multiple times over the last like two years. I, I think there's a lot of people also trying to um, crowdsource this kind of on the water documentation of illicit fishing, at least within artisanal fishing waters and MPAs, where you have a large number of local fishers who are getting tired of encroachment by outsiders. And so you've got um, a number of, of tech firms, and I think USAID's tried to fund some of this and work by a whole bunch of grad students I've talked to in the last few years who are developing things like mobile apps, where if you're, you know, you're a Filipino fisher and you're tired of this guy encroaching into your local waters, you take a few photos. If you can get ship to ship AIS, you document that too. And you pass that to, uh, you know, into the app, which will go to BFAR or PCG or whatever. So I, I think at some point that also might be part of the solution where it won't necessarily apply to distant water fishing vessels, but at least within uh, artisanal waters, you'll have kind of the, you know, the neighborhood watch who's going to be able to document the stuff themselves. Yeah, a, a, a great point. And we, we haven't actually talked about that divide between distant water and the near shore stuff, but those, the, the data there is very different. Um, and, and you do need that reporting. There are a number of groups out there building apps to people for people to be able to take those pictures and report them safely, encrypt them, have them disappear off the phone, all of those sorts of things. There are people out there doing experiments like this. Um, all experiments at this point, but but absolutely a, a, another um, area that, that um, is being addressed and, and will eventually get addressed fully, hopefully. Thank you both. And we'll transition into some closing comments here. And I'll just offer the kind of two final questions that we did receive that I think are pretty good closeouts that if you're able to tie into your closing comments, that would be great. But one, what, what's the biggest challenge to illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing? And then I think the other one that supports this is, you know, how do we go about, you know, that at sea law enforcement to actually combat the underlying beneficiaries ashore? Greg, we'll start with you for those closing comments, and then over to Ted. So I think increasingly we are not going to be talking about the difficulties of getting data, of identifying and tracking vessels, right? I mean, that those, those are technical fixes that if we don't already have the answer to, we kind of know what the answer is going to look like. It's coming into view. The difference between states that are able to effectively monitor their waters and those that aren't is going to be, do they have the capacity to make use of that data? Because we're all just going to be swimming in data. Um, and like I said, we're not that far out from every boat of any appreciable size being identifiable. So a huge part of it, as Ted's talking about, is, is data analytics. Can you make use of the data quickly enough through a combination of, of your own in-house capabilities and whatever you've shopped out to the commercial sector do you have the interagency process set up to get that data where it needs to go? Because if it takes you, you know, five days to declassify and get it across the street from, you know, your Ministry of Defense to your Coast Guard, it's too late. 
Um, and do you have the legal structures in place to allow that to be used as you know, evidence collection and ultimately prosecution? Those are the big questions. It's not how do we ID votes? We already know how we're going to ID votes. Yeah, I, 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 Greg is, is spot on there. Um, the, the technical uh, and data problems are not solved, but they're on the way to being solved. Um, and they'll get increasingly more affordable. Um, we, we have to keep pushing on them to see that happen, uh, but we're on the way there. Um, but we do have to overcome the, the sort of human element uh, one of the things I'll say, we've been, uh, it's been amazing, the engagement from the Coast Guards and Navies, uh, from the various partner countries, often tremendous folks really out there doing great work. Uh, we get into the, when, when that transfers into the realm of, you know, the prosecution and so on, and maybe the fisheries agency or the agencies that are responsible for the MPAs and so on, things tend to sort of bogged down a bit and, and get bogged down. And so we've got to be able to overcome some of those things. I think transparency is one of those things, uh, you know, the, the public awareness that these things are going on um, is tremendously important. And I wanna to touch on the, um, the last point, which was knowing who the, where the, basically follow the money was that one question. Who's, who are the beneficial owners? There are some great folks doing work on that. In fact, we didn't really talk about that whole side of data but I'll just mention um, trig map tracking. There's a group called C4ADS that some of you may know about. Those folks are on the more the intelligence side of things. Uh, so they're tracking back who's the actual owner of this vessel through 20 shell companies. Um, and, and being able to surface that back into the platforms so that we can apply our AI and say, oh, look for these guys because actually they're the ones you want to look for. Um, you know, the, we need to have all of that data working together. Um, but there are folks working on those beneficial, uh, understanding that beneficial owner map as well. Thank you for a very informative session on technology advancing maritime domain, aware, domain awareness. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. To our audience joining us from all over, thank you for your participation today. If you have any questions or ideas for future engagements, please contact APCSS at this email address. Mahalo and aloha.